that story. Let me tell you a story, it's okay? We think this story is absolutely incredible. This is a story that will last uh, two years. Uh, I'm telling you, but uh, when I began it in August of 1940, 100 years ago, when it ends, it's August of 1960, two years ago. past. This is a story about human, the human capacity to endure. Uh, in the verse, by the way, it was the word endurance. I didn't plan that. Uh, but we're going to use that word endurance repeatedly this morning. I think in every one of us, there is something that God put inside of us. And it's a spirit. And that can go a lot of different directions. But I think some of that spirit is about resisting and fighting and putting up your best and doing all you can and working against the long odds. And that can happen in just all kinds of ways. So I'm going to say that. Uh, this morning is about guys who faced absolutely incredible odds. This is a story about a bunch of guys who go down to Antarctica. That's the South Pole. And, and, and the gig they want to do here, uh, they're led by a guy named Ernest Shackleton. Absolutely fantastic. He spent years uh, fighting the Antarctic, trying to get to the pole. Fails in 1909. A hundred miles short of the pole. Fails. He realizes he's not going to make it. If he's going to he's going to die. Takes his men back. He said, 88 degrees. He's, he's 100 miles from the pole. Fails. But he goes back in 1914. He said, I'm going to go back to the pole again. In 1914, he got the edge and he said, Here's what I want to do. I want to cross the entire Antarctic shelf, the entire continent of Antarctica by land. I want to take two ships. You guys are Antarctica this morning. Okay? Very cold and stuff. Here's what he has to do. He wants to put one ship at the end of Antarctica over here at one city. He wants to put a ship on the other side of Antarctica, 1,800 miles away. He wants to get a dog sled, including him, an outfit that will go across the entire length of Antarctica. These guys over here are going to come halfway out and put caches of food and fuel for him so that as his group comes across Antarctica about halfway, they start picking up supplies and stuff. So he can make the entire trip. Yeah, oh my God. It's too windy to say. Look, 1,800 miles across Antarctica. Nobody's ever done it. Probably for a reason, <laughs> but off they go. 28 men on this ship with Shackleton. That's our guy, Ernest Shackleton. He's talking about a man who's born to leave. He had a ship on his own ship, Endurance. He had 27 other men. Endurance is their ship. Over here, the ship Aurora. We'll never talk about them again because they don't make that. They don't get to those guys. What happens is nature takes control. Uh, I'm going to show you here what we're doing. We're going to start out. These guys came from England to South America, land of Buenos Aires. In August 1914, they head off from Buenos Aires to about here. At South Georgia Island, there's a Norwegian whaling station there. They sailed from August of 1914 until November of 1914. At the whaling station, I'm headed to here, we're headed to Antarctica. At the whaling station, they're told the ice pack to the south and the Liddell Sea is very thick, it's very heavy. They sit a month here, rest, prepare, supplies, all that kind of stuff. December 1914, they head toward Antarctica. They will sail six weeks and a thousand miles through ice. They reach here. A hundred miles short of Antarctica. So they'll get surrounded by ice. They get locked in to ice. They're a hundred miles, one day's trip. And they're on land, but they don't make that. They're here, and they get locked in ice. And now it's nature in control. You don't go anywhere but where the ice takes you. What would you do? What would you think? All right, all right. We got lots of food. Lard is full. <clears throat> We're good to go. Twenty-eight guys. Piece of cake. That's seventy dogs. Things go really bad. 
<laughs> By the way, it's going to go really bad. They drift away from Antarctica. They drift about a thousand miles. For about nine months. They're not in control. All they can do is hunger down, play chess, tell stories, read to each other, fix stuff, chop at the ice. The problem is this. Remember, winter and summer reversed here. So as we're going through February 1915, through what would be our spring and summer, that's the dead of winter for those guys. They're locked into ice. They go about eight months till we get to the spring for them. That's September for us. And they know that when spring comes, two things are going to, one or two things are going to happen. Either the ice is going to melt enough that they can be free and then sail down to Antarctica. Or well, that ice is going to start really piling up on them and pressing hard on them and break up their ship. There's one of those they prefer to the other. They do. And about October, the ship starts to leak. There's a plank and it's broken up. And they're starting to get concerned. They're starting to get concerned. What would you do? How would you respond? Scream and kick the cat. Well, who got us into this mess? I didn't sign up for this. Whose crazy idea is this? I don't get paid for this. What would you do? This is October of 1950. I continue to drift. Several hundred miles. By November of 1915, the ship is doing this. And this. And this. And this. And it's starting to break up completely. The final is on its side. Crush. And it sinks. It's November 1915, and you're in the middle of nowhere. We use that phrase, but these guys are in the middle of nowhere. There's nobody close, there's nothing near, there's no radio, there's no shipping lanes, there's nobody who knows where they are. And their ship is gone. And they're on a big sheet of ice. And what would you do? How would you respond? Japan. And that's it. Okay, grief, that's it. We're, we're stuck. We don't have a ship anymore. We've got tents and dogs on ice. And they drift. And about here, it's getting to be April of 1916. We started this in August of 1914. We're now to April of 1916. And the ice is starting to break up. Split. Sounds are just incredible. And you really has to be a genius here. You know what happens next. When this ice melts, we're sunk, literally. Now they have three boats. They have three lifeboats. 22 foot long, 28 men. Shackleton will order come November, we've got to get off this ice floe and get to land. The closest land is here, 350 miles away. You get in your boats, and by the way, the dogs are gone by now. They get in their boats, and they head off to choppy water, 350 miles, to a place called Elephant Island, and they get there. But Elephant Island is nowhere. 
There's nothing close. It's not on any shipping lanes. Nobody knows they're there. Nobody knows anything. They're on land. By the way, when they hit land here, it's been 497 days since they stood on solid land. But this is just a rock outcropping. There's nothing here but seal and tangle. And by the time they finish here, they'll kill hundreds of them. Just to say a lot. Now what would you do? Get mad? Get that? Do you guys think this next? Whose idea was this? I guess I'm not good. Find somebody else? But the morale factor with these guys is absolutely fantastic. Here's what they have to do. From here, what they want is the closest land where there are people and ships is a place called South Georgia Island. You remember, that's there. They're here on Elephant Island. It's 800 miles to here. And they had 20 foot long lifeboats. Shackled from the sides, what has to be decided. You can't stay here. I'm going to take one boat, five guys, six guys me. I'm going to leave 22 of you here with the other two brother boats, flip them over, live under them, hunker down, do as best as you can, boys. We'll go to there and we'll get back as soon as we can. And six men, Shackleton, the captain of the ship, fantastic guy. And uh, Thomas Morrison, absolutely fantastic. Four other men head out in a 20 foot long whaling boat across the choppiest storm driven water on the planet to get to that island and hopefully get a ship to get back to here and rescue these 22 guys. I don't know who I would rather not be. <laughs> The six men in the ship, the boat, the ship, the boat, or the 22 guys left behind. We'll get back when we can. You boys hang in there. You two boss. Everybody call Shaggy the boss. These six men will head out 800 miles to there. There's only four days. The big thing get, that's the worst to get a sextant position using the sun. He, he, he operates here on the basis of what's called dead reckoning. There's about one out of 100,000 people on this planet that can do this. You just know you're going the right direction. Uh, by the way, that's a God-given skill. Right. But they go through storms, they're wet, they're sleeping bank, black, uh, 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 bags are constantly wet. Look, these guys aren't wearing the kind of stuff that we, we wear. Water repellent, you know, kinds of things. They're wearing wool every day. It's, it's warm, but when it gets wet, it stays wet. Uh, so they're cold. They will take two weeks from here to there. And you know what? It's absolutely incredible, but they make it to this height. But when they hit it, they're on the back side of it. They're 22 miles away from the whaling station on the opposite side. These six guys are absolutely worn out. They leave three on the, on the spot of the island where they land. Shackleton will take the captain and one other man named Cream, and they will now journey across this island, 22 miles, up a 4,500 foot elevation mountain, slide down about 1,000 feet on an ice pack, they wind up in a river, they're wet, they go up a 30-foot waterfall. I mean, it's absolutely crazy, crazy stuff. And they make it. When they get to the whaling station, they're not recognizable to these guys they saw about 21 months ago. They're wearing the same clothes they had on for a solid year. They're bearded, they're dark, they're burnt, they're sun, they're sun baked, they're frost dipping. These Norwegians will say, we don't recognize you. We just recognize the voices. Now they're there. But they've got 22 guys back here. Because of all sorts of problems, all sorts of delays. Bureaucratic stuff, storms, four different attempts to get back to, to this island here. They don't get back from here to here 
for four and a half months. 130 days. And you're sitting on Elephant Island, and at what point do you say, all right, mates, that's it. We're done for. Eat the last the distance. We're done. We're all going to die. At what point do you say that? At what point do you say, this is not nice, so we're lucky we got this far. Shackled in the front of your boat, he'll make it back to Elephant Island, but I'm not going to tell you what he finds. Yeah. I want you to see these guys. Show us these guys, right? That's Shackled. All 22 of these men 
survive. All 28 of these men survive. You can't write fiction like that. Nobody would believe. Now, where's that come from? This is, by the way, August of 1916. We've gone two years. Have you survived this? There is a spirit inside the people that I think God put in us. It is not, as, as Paul tells Timothy, not a spirit of what? Timidity. That's not the natural human spirit. Timidity. It's the spirit about power, these things. And love and self-discipline. You think these guys don't love each other? You don't think they wouldn't give anything for each other? You think it's about self-discipline? Of course it's about self-discipline. You think this doesn't show the power of human beings? You bet it shows the power of human beings. But, but before we make human beings all about everything, look, where's that come from? That comes from God. And this is something these guys themselves recognize. Let me read to you something that uh, Shackleton wrote after all this nonsense was over. Here are this. When I look back at those days, I have no doubt that Providence guided us. Not only across those snow fields, but across the storm white sea that separated Elephant Island from South Georgia Island. I know that during that long and racking march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it seemed to me often that we were four, not three. I said nothing to my companions on the point, but afterwards, worse than that, the worst, they said to me, boss, I had a curious feeling on the march that there was another person with us. Cream, third man, cream confess to the same idea. Is that what happened? Is that it? Is that what happened? Did God rescue these men? These men that he put this tremendous human capacity to endure inside? Did he rescue these men? Come down and walk aside? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego moment? Is that what you see? I'll tell you what, I think that sounds exactly like something he would do. Doesn't it? Have a good day.